so what we're going to do this time is we're going to look at a different way of writing down finite element problems. We're going to write down finite element problems as a function instead of an equation. And the reason we're going to write down fun uh, finite element problems as a function instead of an equation is because it's the way into how we might solve a nonlinear problem. And it's also the way into a rather nice way of implementing strong Dirichlet boundary conditions. So that gets us um, to some points there. And it um, also gives some explanation of the relationships between vectors and matrices and um, ideas about actions and how matrix three might work. I'm not sure how much detail we'll get into on that last one. So in order to motivate this, we're going to need another equation. Because the equation we've been looking at so far is the Laplace equation, and we will come back to that a bit later today. But the Laplace equation is, of course, linear. And so it doesn't have the problem that we're about to have. So let's instead write down the Burgess equation, which is a simple case of a nonlinear equation. And so the Burgess equation, which we might write down in one dimension for current purposes, is du dt plus u du dx equals 0. And if you wanted the, the um, multi-dimensional Burgess equation, that's a vector u that becomes u dot grad u. It's the same thing. And so what that is, is actually basically the momentum equation from a flow equation. So this is the rate of change in time of velocity, which is to say the acceleration. Um, is equal to, well, velocity times the spatial slope of velocity. And that is the advection term, right? If I uh, wrote, if I replaced u with a tracer here, if I said the tracer dt is um, u times the tracer dx, then that would clearly be the advection of the tracer. So now we have the advection of the velocity. Uh, that's all just physical motivation. We don't care. This is a straight exercise in mathematics. and what we notice here is that this term's got two u's in it. So this is now a nonlinear equation. Um, we are going to have to do a little bit more work before we do find an element on this, because most people, most of the time, don't do finite element in time. So usually what we do is we adopt the method of lines, and we say we will separately discretize the time derivatives from the space derivatives. And the reason we do this is primarily that there is this um, arrow of time aspect to most of the equations that we solve, which means that if we adopt a separate time discretization, we don't have to store and solve for all of our equation of our own time at once. What we do is we start off with an initial condition, initial state, and then we solve for the next one and the next one, but then we can start forgetting the ones behind us. And that's different from what happens when you do a normal implicit spatial discretization, where you do the whole spatial domain at once. And so the first thing we're going to do is a very simple uh, time discretization. So what we do here is we assume we have some time step, uh, delta t. And so we have u n plus 1. So the next time step of u minus u n over delta t. So that is just a straight um, finite difference approximation to that gradient. right? I've just taken the limit out of the, um, the definition of the derivative. And I then have to decide at which time points I am going to evaluate these. For our current purposes in um, sorting out the how the finite element method works, it doesn't matter much. Right? It does actually matter for the numerical properties of your scheme, what options you choose here. Um, and for the purposes of what we're interested in doing, I don't want to just choose a forward Euler scheme. I don't want to choose this at the old time step. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose what's called backward Euler, which is the simplest thing that it actually has some implicit terms in there, which means that I just take all of these to be new values.
Right? So other options were possible. It is actually quite likely that in most circumstances other options were better. I'm really only choosing this discretization because it's going to be the one that has the least number of symbols on the board while being the finite element case we care about. And um, this equation is a very easy equation to get a weak form for. All we do is we multiply by a test function. So that means that um, So I should write this out. So this is find u n plus 1 in v such that, so remember, u n plus 1 is now the unknown, because at each time step, I knew u n. When we start off, I'll have to prescribe a starting value for u to be the old u n. So that's not really an unknown in this equation. That's a known quantity, but that's an unknown. So it'll be the integral of that plus u n plus 1 u n plus 1 dx v dx equals 0 for all v in v. So that's our normal weak form. right? I multiply by a test function and I say that's allowed to be any test function I like from this uh, suitable domain here, and I'm going to solve that for this guy, which is also in the same function space. So this is actually nothing new. And what I would, um, what I could then do is I could attempt to split this into a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And so the left-hand side would be uh, all of the terms that have the unknown in it, so the un plus ones. And the right-hand side is all the terms that have no unknowns in them. So in this case, that's the old time step. So actually, if you were thinking about this as just a steady problem at un plus 1, it's just like the steady problems we've been studying, where the forcing term, the thing on the right-hand side, is the old value. From our perspective, mathematically, there's no difference. And in fact, that's sort of why method of lines works. right? Now that I've made a decision about the time-stepping scheme, I'm actually back into exactly the same step state we have when we didn't have a time derivative in here at all. The time derivative has gone away. Um, you'll notice I didn't integrate by parts for this one. So as I mentioned, the first time I introduced boundary conditions, um, I'm not going to teach a course here now on partial differential equations. So I'm just going to state at various times what boundary conditions we need. And this is a uh, it's a hyperbolic equation, it's an advection equation, and uh, your PDE theory will tell you that what you need in a uh, hyperbolic equation is you need one boundary condition at any boundary where the flow comes inwards. So basically what that's telling you is you have to say what washes into the domain where that happens. And so if I had a non-zero velocity on the edge of my domain somewhere and the, non and the velocity component was coming into the domain, then I would need to specify a appropriate boundary condition there. For example, a Dirichlet condition there, so I could set the value of the velocity at that point. That would be a legit thing to do. We will come back to that either in the second half of this lecture or next week, right? So for the per current purposes, we'll just ignore the boundary conditions. So we will. Okay, let's let's write this out the other, um, in left hand side and right hand side. So I have the integral of u n plus 1 over delta t uh, u uh, v left to right v plus u n plus 1 d u n plus 1 dx times v dx equals so the minus sign goes away when I put it on the other side the integral of u n over Delta T V DX. And what I would like to now be able to do is my usual trick, I will write U N plus one equals U I phi 
i and I will write v equals v i phi i and I will um, it, um, and so what that will give me is one equation for each phi i and I can I have u i unknowns and phi i uh, and, and I have i unknowns and i equations the same number of unknowns as equations and I just expand it all out. And what I would then do is visit all the terms and build the matrix, and I'm done. There's one horrible problem with this, which is that that doesn't play out for this term here. Right? And the reason it doesn't play out for that term here is the nonlinearity. So what's going on is when I try to expand this term out in terms of the basis functions, I won't just get phi i times phi j because there's a third unknown in here. So I will get phi i times phi j times the gradient of phi k. Right. So an a legitimate plausible answer to that is that I could produce a three tensor like a sparse three tensor, and expand the system out that, and say, okay, it's not a linear system, it's a quadratic system, and so on. Uh, that actually doesn't quite work because it's the same variable, but it's a direction you could think of going in. Even if those weren't the same variable, it's not going to work. The reason it's not going to work is that is a um, computation huge. Right? It's, a, it's not an attractive um, pro pro problem, but actually because they're the same variable, it, you wouldn't um, that if you went down that road, you wouldn't actually get to that formulation. Unfortunately, sorry. So, what do we do? Well, we have to sit back and think about how we solve nonlinear problems in general. So, this is where it becomes useful to write this equation down in a different way. So, instead of moving the right hand side over to the right hand side like this, I'll just take this all away and say, what have I got here? I've got some function, which is given by this guy, and it's a function of u n plus 1 and v. Right, that's this expression here. And this is a common notation for this. So I, normally when you write down a function, it's got more than one argument. You put a comma in between the arguments. And I put a semicolon between the arguments. And the reason I put a semicolon between the arguments is that this is a common convention in this part of analysis for separating arguments in which the function is nonlinear from arguments in which the function is linear. So this thing is linear in V. Right. If I took uh, so that uh, it's really re very clear, right? It's something which is constant in v times v. That's a linear function, and that's integrated. And integration is a linear operator, so that doesn't change the fact that it's linear. Life is good, and it's non-linear in u because of this term. Right. So this is this uh, statement here, and this guy here, this function has the useful property that if un plus 1 solves my equation, then this function is 0. Right? That's, this doesn't seem particularly deep. Right? It's, it seems like an obvious consequence of the previous statement. It is an obvious consequence of the previous statement. But um, that means that what we can do is sit back and go, OK, it's just a function. We can use techniques that we already knew for solving functions equal to zero, for finding the roots of functions in order to solve this guy. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So what we want is to solve for that equal to zero. And so if u n plus 1 conversely is not a solution to the equation, then this is not zero. Right? And that's that's the important property of this guy and, and the fact that it's linear and So what does this mean? So effectively, this needs to be true for all v, right? So 
Um, effectively, the thing I can do with this function is I can choose a value to put in here and evaluate it for all v. Well, I, as we learned before, I, not, I can't evaluate for, for all v because there's infinitely many of them, but I also don't need to evaluate it for all v. I only need to evaluate it for the basis functions. So I choose a value to put in here, and I evaluate it for all the basis functions, and so then I get a vector of values out. I get a vector of values, one for each basis function. So if I choose a u plus uh, n plus 1 and evaluate this for all the basis functions, then I'll get a vector back. And if u n plus 1 was a solution, that vector will be 0, right? Because it has to be the case that this thing is 0 for all choices of v there. So in particular, for all basis functions, this thing will be 0. So that residual vector is 0 if it's a solution. And if any component of that vector is non-zero, then this is non-zero. Life's great. OK. Let's go back now and think about this question. How do I solve? OK, so let's just go back to a function of one variable and ask ourselves, how do I solve for, um, how, how do I solve this equation? Well, there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but the kind of base lead contender, all else being equal, so the, the simplest case is to think about using an iterative method. And if you are if you really know nothing else about the function, then you're going to use something like bisection. Um, bisection doesn't scale wonderfully well into multiple dimensions because your search space gets big. Um, but um, what you can do instead is you could use a Newton method. right? So that would be in an undergraduate numerical analysis class, how do we teach, how do we um, solve an equation like this efficiently and quickly? Well, you do it using Newton's method. And so Newton's method says that I, get, I start off with an initial guess x0, and then I, at each point, I can get a new guess, and the new guess is my old guess plus an update term. And the update term is the negative of f at the last point divided by the gradient of f at the last point. This is hopefully not a big surprise to anyone. And to remind ourselves what that actually meant and where that came from, what you were doing was you were saying, OK, I have this function out here, and it's got a 0 somewhere. And what I can do is I can evaluate the function at any point I choose. Sorry. Of course, at the point, evaluate at the point where. I can evaluate the function at any point I choose. So I start guessing somewhere, and I ask myself, OK, am I at the 0? Well, no, I'm not at the 0. I'm here. So this is f at xn, if that's xn. And what I do is I say, OK, I know where I am, and I know what this gradient is because I can evaluate the gradient at the point I'm at. And so I will approximate my function by a straight line, by a linear function. And so I will say, well, if this were a straight line function at this point, I could now just directly solve the equation for where 0 is. So I'll use that as the next guess. 
and I'll repeat that process and I dive in on this point. And if the function is sufficiently well behaved and you start sufficiently close to zero, then that converges and it converges really fast. It's a quadratic algorithm. So it's re life is really good news. And the um, the way that you got to that realization was by saying that you can approximate a function using its gradients and then higher order terms, right? So the, the way you got to this, um, this function was you said, well, if I have um, f at the point xn and I'm somewhere near that, like that, so I'm at some displacement away from that, well that's equal to this value, well that's approximating the function as a constant function, that's saying the constant doesn't change, plus h times f prime xn plus h squared on 2 f double prime xn plus h cubed on 6 f triple prime xn plus and so on. Right? That's the Taylor series. And so the way you got the Newton method was you said, okay, what I'm looking for is the point at which this is zero. Right? I'm looking for a point at which f of where I am plus a bit is actually a zero of the equation. So, so that's equal to zero. And I approximate my function by these, um, I approximate the function by the first couple of terms here. So I say that this is approximated by this guy here. And now I solve this equation for h. So I solve this equation for what the distance was from where away my, where my solution is. So that means just saying that h f prime x n is approximately minus f of x n. And so h is approximately uh, minus f of x n over f prime at x n. Okay, so that was the solution for how much I needed to move. Of course, um, I wasn't really interested in how much I needed to move. I actually wanted to know where the zero was. So where the zero is, is so the zero, well, I know it's not going to be the zero because there's an approximation in here. So my next guess at the zero is my last guess at the zero plus the amount I needed to move to get to the zero. And so that's just xn minus f xn over f prime xn. Okay, so that's derivation of the Newton's method. So the reason I dragged you through that whole sorry story, which most of you have probably seen uh, before, certainly in undergraduate courses, maybe even in high school, is to refresh it in your memory so that we can now go back and attempt to do exactly the same thing again, but to this guy. Right, so we're going to attempt to use Newton's method to solve this guy for x and n plus 1. And so, in order to do that, we need to think about what it means to get the 
this guy? Right? What does it mean to take the gradient of this guy? And we kind of actually know because two weeks ago we did it. We did it in a slightly different context, but that's why we did that particular derivative last time. So two weeks ago, we learned about the Gatto derivative, which I'm not going to write on the board because I will misspell it. Um, and so we learned how to define this. So what we want is that the derivative of this, and now remember, it's the derivative in the direction of some u vector u. And I'm so I'm so that's going to be so when we take um, the derivative of a function, we get an extra variable, right? We get the direction that the derivative is in, and we tend to not write that down in one-dimensional calculus because there is only one direction. But in multi-dimensional calculus, we have to do that. So when we write a gradient in vector calculus, we take the gradient of a scalar-valued function, and it's a vector. Why is it a vector? It's a vector because we've now got an extra argument. We've got an extra argument of which direction are we going in. And if I give you a direction, and we dot it with that gradient, then I get back a number. Right. So this is the same thing here. And this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f at un plus 1 plus h u tilde b minus f at un plus 1 B all over H. So same gasso derivative as two weeks ago. So what I do, I perturb this guy a little bit in the direction of U tilde, and I take the limit as that perturbation goes to zero. So the only thing is now a bit surprising is last time we did the Gatto derivative, we did the Gatto derivative as a new way of deriving grad, the normal vector derivative operator. And that meant that the functions we had here were functions of vectors. So now the functions here are functions of functions, right? These guys are all functions in function spaces. But that's okay. So for starters, half of you in the room are computer scientists, so you're saying, well, you know, that's a higher order function, so what? That's good news. But the other thing is, way back in the very first lecture of this course, we learned about function spaces, and we learned that, in fact, these functions are vectors. Right? Those functions have all the important properties that I need of vectors. In particular, all I need to be able to do here is add these functions and multiply functions by a scalar. Just exactly the properties that I get because functions are vectors. So this is a completely legitimate and normal thing to do. And so what we will now do then is play this out by um, choosing to take the derivatives of some functions that we know. And so one of the functions we could do, so we're going to ease ourselves into this the, the relaxed way. So we'll start off with our original favorite equation, which was the Poisson equation. So in our original Poisson equation, we had um, the integral of grad u dot grad v dx equals the integral of f v dx. So that's in our original left-hand side, right-hand side form, right? But that's OK, because some of us learned how to do um, algebraic manipulation sometime in high school. So OK. So now it's in residual form, right? So f of u and v is 
this guy, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. So now we'll do this the long-winded way and actually expand that guy out to um, using these rules to get its derivative with respect to u. So what do I do? I say I say that d f u v u tilde is equal to um, the um, so it's f of u plus, uh, so there's a limit as h goes to 0 of, so f of u plus h u tilde, so that is the integral of the <coughs> grad of u plus h u tilde dot grad v minus f v the x, so that's the first one of these, and I subtract off that the integral of grad u dot grad v minus f v dx, and I divide all of that by h. So now I can do the easy cancellation, which is that they cancel. So that's good news, right? The constant term does not appear in the derivative. That should be a, a source of great relief to all of us. It wouldn't be a particularly normal derivative if the constant term did anything in it. And now what do I need to do? I need to exploit the fact that this gradient operator is linear, which means I can expand this out to be the limit as h goes to 0 of the integral. Okay, the integral is um, linear as well. So we'll put one integral around the whole thing because that's that's an easy thing to do. And I get grad u dot grad v plus grad uh, h grad u tilde dot grad v. Right, that is linearity here, right? So Linearity means I can take the u plus hu outside the gradient sign, I can take it outside the dot product, I can take the h outside the front. That's just a straight linearity of those operators. And that is minus grad u dot grad v. So there's a grad u dot grad v and there's a minus grad u dot grad v, so they go away. Oh, and this is all still divided by h. So that gives me the limit as h goes to zero, of the integral of h times grad u tilde times grad v dx. So that is right, the h is cancelled. So where did that get us? Exactly the same. Um, which is what we expect, right? This is a linear operator. We expect the gradient of the linear operator to be itself. Just as exactly the same result we got two weeks ago. Took so a gradient of linear operator and we got the operator back itself. Um, what this means. Um, is that um, when you set up Newton's method on a linear operator, then that approximate equals in the middle becomes an exact equality. So the way to understand that is this thing now is constant in U, right? It's got a U tilde in it. It's got an arbitrary choice direction, but it doesn't have a U in it. So if I took another derivative of this with respect to u, I would get 0. Which is another thing we expect of linear functions. right? We expect a linear function to have one non-trivial derivative, and the second derivative is going to be 0, and all the subsequent ones are going to be 0. So that means if you do Newton's method 
on a linear equation, then you will get the right answer first time. And in fact, for FireDrake users, that is exactly what FireDrake does. FireDrake actually, under the hood, treats all finite element problems as nonlinear. So when you feed it in a linear problem in this, in the left-hand side, right-hand side form, it turns it into this form and keeps going through. The only thing it does, the one optimization, is it doesn't do the derivative because you already told it what the derivative was. It uses that as the expression. Okay, so before we go back and turn this into um, Newton's method, let's do the slightly less trivial one, and let's take the derivative of the Burgers equation. So that's why we introduced the Burgers equation, so that we have a relatively simple non-linear equation that we can use for these purposes. Okay, I'll leave the definition up there and I'll put my Burgers turn back on. Actually, what I'll do is we'll save a little bit on the writing, and what we'll do is we'll take the derivative of the nonlinear term, because that's the one that counts, right? The other terms, um, we know what they are. Uh, actually, well, I know. I'll, I'll write it all out. We'll, we'll have the whole story. So, it is the integral of un plus 1 minus un over delta t plus un plus 1 um, the u n plus one the x all times v the x. Okay. Um, so we're going to take the derivative of this. So the derivative of that guy, comma u tilde. So I apologize to the notation fascists for my appalling abuse of notation there, but that's what's going on. This is going to be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of um, u n plus 1 plus h u tilde minus u n over delta t plus u n plus 1 plus h u tilde d u n plus 1 plus h u tilde dx Integral up front here and a bracket v the x minus the integral of u n plus one minus u n over delta t plus u n plus one d u n plus one D C B X. Okay, in order to preserve sanity and board space, let's do some serious cancellation. So in the um, so the constant term is gone. Um, this term is gone. And um, if I expand out um, okay that's not okay I'm gonna have to no I can't cancel anything immediately there we'll have to come back and do the expansion here so the only thing that's left so this guy is absolutely that's completely gone so that this bit is left in here so that's not a big surprise right so that's um, the linear term the linear term has a gradient which is going to be itself Oh, all of this has a big divided by h out the front, right? That's the other important rule. So the, the linear term is going to have the right term in it, but now we have to worry about this guy. 
So this is where Florian gets to operate his panning machine over there. And so what we need to do is expand out these brackets. So when we expand out these brackets, we just need to remember that DUDX is a linear operator. So I can expand out the brackets on that as well. So I get, um, in the usual manner, so I get U, so let's be pedantic about this, limit as H goes to zero of one H outside of the integral of the term I haven't lost here, which is H U tilde over delta T plus, okay, now we can start the expansion. So, um, U N plus one times the first bit of this, which is D <coughs> U N plus one D X. Now this one times the second bit of this, which is U N plus one D H U tilde D X. Plus um, the second part of this times the previous. So plus H U tilde D U N plus one D X plus H U tilde D H U tilde D X. Um, all minus, so I still have to keep this term in here, un plus 1 du n plus 1 dx, and all of that is still times v dx. Okay, so there's one more cancellation to occur. This guy is this guy. And so now I actually need to do the limit. So let's cancel through the H's. So that H cancels with that H. It cancels with that H, because the derivative is linear, so I can take the H outside. It cancels with that H. And it cancels with one of the H's in here. This means that when I take the limit as h goes to zero, this term is gone. Because it's got an h in it. So that means that this thing is actually equal to u tilde over delta t plus u n plus one the u tilde the x plus U tilde d u n plus one d x. And what that is there is just the product rule for calculus. Right? So what I got was I took the derivative of two functions multiplied together. And so each of these is a linear function, right? So first of all, I get the derivative of the first one times the second. So the derivative of un plus 1 is u tilde, right? It's itself. So that's this term here. And then I get the first one times the derivative of the second one. So that's this term here. So it is just the product rule. So it, everything that just happened just behaved exactly as if these were just numbers. The fact that there was a function in there did not matter. The differentiation rule comes out to be exactly the same. Um, and that should not be a huge surprise because basically the all of the algebraic rules on functions that are relevant are the same as the algebraic rules on numbers. So that um, works out. So this is a really kind of deep consequence of the fact that we can treat um, functions as vectors and do algebra on them.
we can get so far that we can even do calculus on them. But people are into the deep pure maths analysis stuff, uh, the completion of the spaces and things like that matter in this context. But for our purposes, the spaces we work in are sufficiently well behaved that this all works out. Okay, so we're going to stop there now, and then we're going to come back after the break and understand how that fits into doing a Newton method and actually solving a nonlinear problem.